The church is the creation of the Holy Spirit. And the church that is managed by man instead of led by the Holy Spirit is doomed for failure. The presence of the Holy Spirit is vital and is central to the work of the church. Without him, the church is powerless in its mandate to establish God's kingdom on earth. God is calling his church to return to its source of life, wisdom, leading, and power. God is calling all of us. Today, Pastor Terry will share his thoughts on the powerless church in a sermon entitled, The Tragedy of a Powerless Church. Let's now join Terry in the sanctuary. So today, I want to talk about, and actually, I, I, after I saw it, I don't like the title of the, of the sermon, but I'm just going to go ahead and go with it, and it's called The Tragedy of a Powerless Church. The Tragedy of a Powerless Church. And I want this to be an uplifting sermon. And so don't feel like, oh, well, he's, it's tragedy, he's going to beat up on us. No, I'm not going to do that today, okay? But the powerless church, we live in a world today, it's really out of control. And if the church was in its position of authority, it would make a difference upon the governments. It would make a difference upon the school systems. It would make a difference upon social life as well as private life because that's the power of God. That's the power of God. And he wants to transform our world. He wants to transform our lives. And he wants to transform our nation as well. But uh, we see things that looks like, my goodness, what happened? Is God asleep? No, I think more than likely the church is. I think we've forgotten where our source of power comes from. Because we get inside church and we get in the habit of doing church. And I'm, I'm very guilty of this. We get in the habit of doing church. And we could do the mechanics of church. And you guys could do the mechanics of your self saved life, just doing the mechanics. But God wants this intimate, personal, daddy, daughter, and son relationship. And he wants to pour out his spirit in you that gives you life victorious over this world and victorious over the temptations and sin. They're still going to come, but you're going to be mighty. You're going to be overcomers. You're going to be more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who gives you strength through the Holy Spirit in your life. So that's what God wants to do. And when the church operates in that, the world recognizes it. Right now, the world recognizes something different. I want to read some scripture to you here, and it kind of gives us an understanding. This is found in Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 18. And uh, open your Bibles. Please bring Bibles. But mark in your Bibles what it is. But also, it's going to be up here for those who don't have it. And just go ahead and read along as well. But I always encourage, mark your Bible up so, so that you'll go back. It just sticks better. Anyway, right before I read this, this comes from Jesus, took three of his disciples, I think it's Peter, James, and John, took them up to the top of this mountain, and then now it's called the Mountain of Transfiguration. Why is that? Because when Jesus went up there with these three disciples, it was there that God came down. So Jesus and these three disciples are up there, they're praying, and all of a sudden, the glory of God just came down like a cloud around the place. And then while they were there, all of a sudden, uh, uh, Peter and them, they saw, uh, they saw two people that came from heaven. That, uh, who was it? Help me out here, church. Elijah and Moses. Elijah and Moses. I knew that. I'm just testing you. I didn't know, but I forgot it at the moment, okay? Just like I forget my kids' names. But anyway, Elijah and Moses, here we go. They came down, and they ministered to Jesus Christ. And then Peter, and then when they saw this, it's like, whoa, look at the light, look at the glory, look at all this. And they were in awe. They were shocked. And then here they are ministering. And while they was doing that, all of a sudden, they heard a voice from God. It says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Listen to him. And... Uh, at that moment, they saw all this stuff, and they was, wow. And so Jesus, on the way down from the mountain, he told me, he says, don't tell anyone about that until later on, OK? And as they came down, and here is where the story picks up. Verse 14 says this, and when they, which is Jesus and his three disciples, returned to the other disciples, they was down at the bottom of the uh, mountain there, they saw a large crowd surrounding them. And some of the teachers of the religious law were arguing with them. And when the crowd saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with awe, and they ran to greet him. I always wonder what that meant by that. I don't know if maybe he still had that glory about him, that glow about him. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But something about him, it was just in awe. But when Jesus came down, what happened? What, the first thing he saw, he just saw his disciples surrounded by people, and they were arguing with the disciples. Verse 16, what is all this arguing about, Jesus asked. And one of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, teacher, which is interesting. 
Jesus is asking, what's it arguing about? And it's more than likely it's between the, it was between the religious leaders and the disciples, but none of them answered. They all went quiet. But then another guy spoke up. He says this and said, teacher, I brought my son to you so you could heal him. He is possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. And whenever this spirit seizes him, it throws him, into violent, throws him violently to the ground. Then he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth or gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirit, but they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. Interesting. Before this, we read in the Bible where Jesus sent out his disciples, as well as many other disciples, not just these 12, but many other disciples. And they went out to says, I want you to go. I want you to give the gospel to people everywhere. And as you go, I want you to bless them. And as you go, I want you to cast out demons. I want you to take authority over these things. And I want you just to bless and give life and destroy the works of the devil. And sure enough, they did. The Bible says that when all these disciples came back and they, was, they came back two by two and they was all rejoicing, it says, wow, Jesus, you won't believe it. Even the demons trembled and they fled when we laid hands on people and we prayed for them. God, the miracles were just awesome, awesome, awesome. And Jesus said at that moment, he goes, you know, that is great. He goes, but right now rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Miracles are cool. That's Terry's translation. Miracles are awesome and they're cool, but rejoice in that your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. And that's, he really wanted to bring it back to that because sometimes we can get caught up in like, I want to see miracles, I want to see miracles. And by the way, I want to see miracles, I want to see miracles. How about you? I want to see because, why? Because we know the power of God. We know the love of God. And we know that God's will is to bless people. But we also know we live in a world that's full of sin and hurt and pain and that there's those things as well that we have to go through. The Bible says that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but they will rise back up. Amen? So we are going to go through some hard times, but I still know God raises people from the dead. Amen? I still know that God heals blind people and deaf people and sick people. Amen? He still takes away headaches. Amen? <laughs> Our God is on the throne. He's powerful. And so his disciples, this guy brought this, his son, his son, no, he loves. He brought his son. That's interesting. We're talking about that. To Jesus. And he says, cast this demon out. But your disciples couldn't. And so what was happening there? Because there was no power there, something else was happening is instead. The religious leaders, the religious teachers were arguing with the disciples. Isn't it amazing that most of the opposition that Jesus encountered was through who? Atheist? No. It was the religious teachers, wasn't it? Why? I always, you ever sit and wonder why? Because we always think of these, we always picture them as like, we're snotty and all that kind of stuff. You know, they're real high and mighty and all that kind of, we always picture them like that. More than likely, they looked a lot like us. <laughs> no one's laughing with me. Okay, anyway. <laughs> More than likely, they look a lot like us, but the thing is this, religion. What is religion? One of the things of religion, religion's not bad in itself, but when religion is just all about the rules instead of about grace and mercy and love, that's wrong. When religion uh, is all about that you have the do's and the don'ts as opposed to God loves and God wants to heal, that's wrong. And so here we have these people, and, and also this, if religion is all about your tradition instead of what God wants to do, it's wrong. Traditions are fine, but when we worship tradition, that's wrong. It's amazing. God's always changing. Why is that? Well, because I believe the generations are changing. God is, uh, he's relevant to every generation, every single time through all these thousands of years, is he not? And it changes all the time. So I believe God is very relevant to people in their lives and even today. But here we have a large crowd arguing, these, these guys arguing. And what did the Bible also say? It says there was a large crowd around them witnessing. You know, when the world sees us arguing with each other, the world, the world sees that and they're like, they're not, can I tell you this? They're not turned on by it. <laughs> they're turned off by it. When they see the church is bickering and fighting or putting down this preacher or putting down that denomination, putting down that church, they, all they see is division. And they, why would I want to be a part of that? They see a myriad of different denominations. Well, you know, there are different things, minor things, but the major things is that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus died on the cross, he is buried in the tomb, and he rose from the grave. Those are the major things, amen? So we can agree on those things. 
God didn't call us to just start putting down everybody else around. And that's what's happening right there. When Jesus saw that man, he was like taken back by it. First of all, I want to give two things. I want to give two things, accounts that I observed in this particular scripture reading. And number one, that is what the devil does to people. When we read this, we see what the devil does to people. And it should make us angry. It should make us angry. And he still does it today. Again, I'm going to read part of it, and it's in Mark 9, 17, the last half of 17 and 18. The Father says, He is possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him go, won't let him talk. And whenever the spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground. Then he foams at the mouth and grinds, or your Bible may say gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. The first thing we notice is this, that the devil seizes people. This world is seized by people. This world is seized by the devil all over the place. We see it in lives that are broken. We see it in lives that are, are so addicted that they can't break free from, free from the addiction that's in their life. We see it in, in marriages and relationships that are broken from within. That's where the devil comes in and he seizes those things. And we've we got to kick him out. As Larry said today, kick him out. Kick him out. Take authority over him. We see that the devil seizes people. They're no longer able to control themselves and other powers and control their lives. They think, they say, and they do the wrong things. That's what happens when the devil comes into our lives. Amen? That's very true. The second thing we notice what the devil does is this. He throws them to the ground. That's just amazing. I mean, whenever these people who try to worship the devil and think he's awesome and powerful, I'm telling you right now, that devil is not their pal. If you've ever experimented or you're thinking of experimenting with the witchcraft, thinking because it's kind of cool, or thinking maybe I like the power of it. And that's why many, many people get into witchcraft, because they want the power. And the devil promises them that. And they have a feeling of power, and people fear them. And that's why many get into it. The devil always abuses them and uses them and takes their lives. Because why, church? The devil comes but to kill, steal, and destroy. And that's exactly what he does is here. He tears people down. He does not build them up. The ultimate end is down for everyone. What are the effects of the devil seen in the life of those he influences? We see the foaming of the mouth. In other words, they're embarrassed before God. You ever see people who do that? They have a convulsion, whatever it is. They're very embarrassed. They're very shocked. The devil just wants to bring shame. He wants to bring embarrassment. Number two, the gnashing of teeth. What is this? This is a precursor to hell, is it not? The Bible says in hell where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, is it not? And that's what the devil wants to do in people's lives today, and that's what he's doing to this young man right here and becoming rigid. Uh, rigor mortis is a, a spiritual condition, in, in capacity and inability to change. And the devil does not want change in your life for good. And so he comes and he takes control of people's lives and he wants to do it in your family's life and in you as well. But you know what? Listen, I, by the way, I want to say this. Side note, if you have the spirit of God inside of you, the devil cannot own you. Amen? You can listen to him, you can obey him, and you can fall for his lies and tricks, but he can never enter you. He never can be possessed by the demon because you're possessed by the Holy Spirit. Amen? That's a good thing to say. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. So I just want that to be known. Many times in the church, we see, we, the church sees the world. I'm sorry. Many times the church sees the world as those who are under the influence of the devil. We see them as the enemy. Church, we got to not see them as the enemy. They are the victims. Amen? Say, the world is the victim of the devil. And Jesus came to, to set them free, and that's what he wants us to do as well. We are called to lead as many as we can to the salvation knowledge of Jesus Christ. But the powerless church can't do that very well. It can't. Powerless church likes to argue and fight. When you don't have the Spirit of God ruling in the church, you have arguments. And that's what the devil wants. He wants to split up the church as well. The number th second thing that we notice also in this that this reveals the powerlessness of the church. I guess I should have put Ness on the end of that. That reveals the powerlessness <laughs> of the church. Mark 9, 18, the last half, it says this. The guy says, uh, the father says, so I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirit, but they couldn't do it. They were unable to set the boy free. Instead, they were caught up in arguments. It was caught up in debates. It was caught up bickering and fighting amongst the religious leaders. And religion loves to grab a hold of us and so we are no longer focused on what God has called us. Religion causes us to lose our focus, which is Jesus Christ, amen? That's what religion can do, wrong religion can do in our lives. 
The church is powerless when it negates the Holy Spirit and tries to just to operate in the natural. Today, in the church, in America at least, and I'm sure it's like this throughout the world in many parts, we've negated, we've neglected, I guess neglect is a good word, the Holy Spirit and what he wants to do in our lives. We've neglected him. We've not gone after him. We've not sought him. We've not sought his wisdom or his leading or his guiding. We've not surrendered our whole lives to him. And in neglecting that, we start to do church, we start to do Christianity, we start to do our lives in a physical way. We start to do things in the natural way, the things that seem natural. The Bible says uh, that we're not to use our natural mind for the spiritual. For God, the things of God are spiritual things, amen? And God doesn't want us doing those things. So the church is powerless when it neglects the Holy Spirit and operates in the natural. To run an organization, to run church, you really don't need God. For us to do things right here, you really, and churches around the world are asleep are proof of that. You don't need God to run a church. I want to give you a quote. This is by Samuel Chadwick, and it says this, the church that is man-managed instead of God-governed is doomed to failure. A ministry that is college-trained but not spirit-filled works no miracles. The church that multiplies committees and neglects prayer may be fusses, noisy, enterprising. It may be noisy or fussy and enterprising, but it labors in, vain, in pain and spends its strength for naught. Without the Holy Spirit, church is lifeless. It's lifeless, just like that young man. He was, the, God, these disciples could not cast those things out because this, this boy was lifeless. And it's because... The spirit was neglected in those things as well. The word is powerless to save itself in the natural. The world is. See, if the world could save itself, it would do it. We have, listen, I'm not down on psychology or a psychologist. My daughter is training to be one, okay? So I have to change my mind. No, 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 I'm all for it. I'm all for it. But uh, the world seeks that for the change, or they'll seek the money for the change, or they'll seek a different wife or a spouse for the change. Or they'll seek a different job for the change. They're looking for anything for the change in the natural. And they don't have that change. They don't have that peace. They don't have that joy. They don't have the victory in their lives. They don't have the power of the world and the devil. They don't have it because they're doing it in the natural and not in the spiritual. Our battle is spiritual, amen? We learned that many, many moons ago. For our, for our, vic for our battle is not in the natural. It is in the spiritual realm. Hallelujah. The world is powerless to save itself. And they look into the church, and if the church operates in the natural, the world is doomed. And, that's what, and praise the Lord, that's not who we're going to be. That's not who we are. That's not what we're about. We are seeking the Holy Spirit. Why are you talking so much about the Holy Spirit, Pastor Terry? Because the Lord has really, number one, placed it on my heart, and I'm listening to him. And uh, number two, I had a number two, but it just flew away right about that second. Uh, why? Oh, Yeah. Because if you look in Scripture, and I told you this last week, if you look in all four of the Gospels, what do you find? There's different stories, and sometimes the stories in this Gospel, sometimes the ones in here, and they, may not have, they don't have all the same stories, but they have some in their collection. But the fourth stories that they have in every single Gospel is the death of Jesus Christ, the burial of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. God says, this is important. And I want you to know, and I want you to be filled with my spirit so that you will not be powerless. You'll be powerful. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. That's where God wants us to be. And listen, God doesn't want all of us to come in here and just get worked up and get excited. And I like getting excited. And I like getting worked up sometimes. I'll be honest with you. But that's just my nature. But the thing is this, if we leave here and we're not changed, we're just still powerless. Wow. We wasted a lot of energy. And that's not, God does not want that in our lives. It's possible to excel in the mechanics of Christianity, but fail in the dynamics of the Spirit of God. And God wants us to be there. So we need, and with this, I'm, I want to kind of bring it to a close here. We need a supernatural power. Say this with me. I need a supernatural power. <laughs> that comes from God. Amen. The presence of the Spirit is vital and it is central to the work of the church. Please know that. The infilling, listen, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, not just the Word of God. And the Word of God is spirit, by the way. It is spirit. But the Holy Spirit as well, it is vital to the workings of the church. 
to do it the way the church, God has called the church to be. And what has God called the church to do? Just like he called Jesus. Destroy the works of the devil. Amen? Bind up the brokenhearted and bring healing. Amen? That's what we're to do. And that's what we're about. And we can't do that in the flesh. All we could do is a lot of potlucks and maybe have a garage sale here and there and maybe give a circus over here. But other than that, you know, it's nothing. God wants everlasting life. And that comes when there's life in the spirit of God. The presence of the Spirit is vital and central. We need the power of God to do a couple things. Number one, you need the power of God to love people. Amen? You know, I would hate you if it wasn't for the Spirit of God. (laughs) You would hate me if it wasn't for the Spirit of God. And if you hate me, you don't have the Spirit of God. (laughs) Seriously, we need the Spirit of God to love people. Today in Sunday school class, uh, we watched a video by, who knows Penn and Teller, the, the magicians? One guy's quiet, and the other guy's big and, and loud. Well, anyway, the big guy, his name is Teller. Anyway, he gave a testimony. And uh, first of all, we watched videos of him saying he's an atheist and there is no God and kind of mocking it and putting it down and blaming God for his mother's paralyzed body in the last years of her life and just went on and on. But then we watched a video which was just recently released, and he, Penn, I'm sorry, Mr. Teller, He made this video himself. He's sitting there with the camera, and he says, and he kept talking about how at the end of the show, this one particular guy came up to him. He says, this guy was big, but he was just very nice. And he looked him in the eyes, and he says, this guy was sane. He saw sanity in the guy. He didn't just see a crazy Christian. And he says, and and everything about him, he was genuine in his compliments. He was genuine in his admiration of the show and all that kind of stuff. And he says, then he handed me a Gideon Bible. And he even wrote in the front of it uh, some things. He says, I enjoy the show, all that kind of stuff. If you ever need to get a hold of me, here's my number. And he gave like five different phone numbers for him to contact him. And he says, he felt the love of God out of that guy. He, this guy was nice, 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 sane, sane, sane. He couldn't say enough of good things about this guy in his life. Why is that? Because the world knows when, when we love them and when we don't. The world knows when we love them or when we're going out there to get a got one for the old uh, Bible, got one for the old, uh, uh, you know, I handed out my tracks today, Yahoo, I got my points on the belt here, whatever it may be, whatever way you're keeping track. The world knows when we do that. And the world knows when we love them. The world knows when we tolerate them. And we just were nasty to them. And the world knows when we're concerned and listening to what they have to say and, and hearing their pain and knowing what's going on and offering understanding, offering, even crying with them, and offering something that the Holy Spirit can give you. Because the Holy Spirit will give you something. When you love people, listen to me, listen to me. When you love people and the Holy Spirit makes you love people, he will give you something for them. He'll give you a word of knowledge. And you'll just think, well, it's just kind of in my own mind. No, that's God. That's the Holy Spirit. And he speaks in their lives through you because you love them. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives so we can, say it with me, love people. One more time. So we can That's right. We need the Spirit of God so we can witness to people. What causes people not to witness? Fear. And we don't witness. What is the biggest and the main thing that you notice in the uh, book of Acts when Pentecost came and the Holy Spirit came down? What was the first thing you noticed? People, they witnessed. They witnessed, they witnessed, they witnessed. They went all over the world and witnessed, 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 witnessed. It's not like they just, all right, let's practice it. And there's nothing wrong with practicing witnessing. Let me tell you that, okay? There's nothing wrong with that. But there's something about it when you go out with the Spirit of God, not just the mechanics, amen? But you go out with the Spirit of God inside of you, you're able to witness. You don't fear people. You don't fear what they say about you. You don't fear death. And that's why people go into deepest parts of the jungle. They go into the places where Muslims live and they are killing people. They go into the darkest and deepest spiritual places where there's witchcraft. They go there because they don't fear it. Because they have the Spirit of God inside of them. The Spirit of God gives you boldness. Hallelujah. And we need that boldness. And you can't work that up because you'll get in there and go, "Ah," and you're dead. Amen? Okay. Read between the lines. "Ah." Okay, all right. Here we go. So we need the power of God to love people, to witness to people. We need the power of God to pray the heart of God over people. God has a heart for the people that are lost. And now he wants that heart to beat inside of us. And so we need his spirit and his heart inside of us so we will pray his prayers over a world that needs Jesus Christ. Amen? Say, Terry, you're preaching great. Liars. Okay, here we go. 
Here we go. Just a second. Gurgle, gurgle, gurgle. All right, we need the power of God so we can destroy the works of the devil through mighty miracles. You know, there's been many a Christians who were frauds who've been exposed for faking miracles. There have been. I've seen some of them where this guy has a, a, a speaker in his ear and his wife is reading some of the names of the cards off and saying they're sitting over there, they're from this such and such a place, they have this sort of thing. And so he acts up there like he's hearing from God and he's giving them word. And people are like, wow, this is God, this is God. And then they get exposed. What do you think that does to it? You know why they do that? Because there's no spirit. They're doing things. And they want things to happen just like we want things, but we want to do it right. And it's the infilling of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Church, we need the Spirit of God. We need the baptism of the Holy Spirit for all these things as well as true miracles. Does God do true miracles today, church? Yes. Is he the same Jesus yesterday, today, and forever? Yes. He does the same miracles. Is he any less powerful today than he was when he created the world? No. Really? Then we should be excited about that. We should be excited about that. Hallelujah. For some reason, I... Um, Apart from the Holy Spirit, wisdom becomes folly, strength becomes weakness. But I have something here in the brackets I put, and so let me read over so I make sure I say it. It must be important if I put it that way. The world must witness God's power in the church. Amen? The world's got to witness it in us. And that's the only place they're going to witness it. Power not only in our words, but in our changed lives. That's where we also need the baptism of the Holy Spirit, so we can have changed lives. I, God loves us talking about people and seeing people saved, but God also wants to change you and me. He wants to change us because he knows we've still got broken things in our lives. Isn't that amazing? He's like, you're broken? Get out of here. Get away from me. You're plagued. He doesn't do that. Not, not God. God knows we're broken, and he does not leave us, nor does he forsake us. But the thing is this. He wants to bring us into healing. He wants to lead us into that. So the world must witness God's power in the church, power for changed lives, power for our restored relationships, power for supernatural joy and peace, power for supernatural love, and that miracles are performed through God's church. God's going to do miracles in this church. Well, at least there's going to be five miracles at least. <laughs> God's going to perform miracles in this church. Not because he's saying, come to the Holy Spirit show. Ha ha. And he's not doing that, okay? <laughs> he's not here to juggle. He's not here to entertain. He's here to change lives. And he will do miracles because he's a miracle working God. You think miracles are hard for God? Absolutely not. Because our God is a miracle worker. Amen? So the church needs to be filled with the Spirit of God. The church's power source is the continual presence of the Holy Spirit. Church, we, need to be, we are supernatural people. And could you uh, come play keyboards for me? Or she's pointing at Jimmy to play keyboards. All right, now they're arguing. See, look at that. They need the Spirit of God right over there. <laughs> Dear Lord, forgive me for that. The church's power source is the continual presence of the Holy Spirit. You know... We can come and be filled with the Spirit of God, hallelujah, we're saved. But you know what? We need to take him home, and we need to pray in the Spirit at home. When you're mowing the grass, and that's where God loves to hear me praying, <laughs> and the shower. When you're, when you're doing your everyday things, pray in your spiritual language. You, if you got it, do it. You got it. Flaunt it, baby. Use it. Amen? Don't flaunt it, but pray. Pray in the Spirit. Pray continually in the Spirit. The Bible says to pray. Paul says, I pray in the Spirit continuously, and I pray more than all of you, and I wish that you would pray in the Spirit. Paul said that. That's for us today. We need to be praying in the Spirit of God. You're supernatural. You're supernatural people. You're no longer just physical in this world. You are supernatural because you have the Spirit of God inside of you. You're the temple of God. You're supernatural, church. That means you're above nature. You're above the things of this world. You're above of just doing things physically. God's called you to do things spiritually. You are supernatural. Hallelujah. We are citizens of a supernatural kingdom. Are we not? We're more than just citizens of Rochester, Indiana. We're citizens of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and not just this world. We are the tabernacle of the Holy Spirit. 
And by the way, when I say that, immediately I know the enemy conjures up an idea and an image in your head. Wacky, crazy Christians. It's going to have us doing things. It's going to have us dancing around. It's going to have us rolling on the floor. It's going to have us touching us. We're going to fall backwards. We're going to shake, and we're going to see gold dust flake down from the ceiling. You know what I'm saying? And then when, when I wake up, there's going to be snakes handling around everywhere. You know what? Seriously, the devil puts those images in your head and that fear in your heart. Know it from where the source is. It's the devil. Cast it out. Say, no, 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 no. Not my God. My God's good. Hallelujah. My God wants me. My God loves me, and he has a spirit for me, and I'm going to use it against you, enemy, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. We are citizens of a supernatural kingdom, not this world. We are the tabernacle, and uh, we are not crazy. <laughs> Say, I am not crazy. Hallelujah. We must be filled with the spirit of God. I want to read you one last scripture, and this is Ephesians 5, 18 through 20. And this is Paul talking. So what does it mean to be filled with the spirit continuously? It means this. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Did you guys know that you guys can sing spiritual songs? Just a second. I, someone is a, a... I want to turn this off. I, I apologize for even having this noisy thing on. In Jesus' name, be cast out. There you go. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. See, when people drink and they get drunk, what influences them? That drink. Their life is influenced by the drinking. And he says, don't let that influence your life. He says, instead, say instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. And <coughs> Excuse me. And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just as a person is filled with wine, is under the influence, God wants us to be filled with the Spirit of God so we're under His influence. Amen? That's what it's about. Surrendering every aspect of your life to Jesus Christ. Surrendering every part of your life to the Holy Spirit so that you be filled with Him and be influenced by Him. That's what it is. It's that simple. What do I got to do? What do I, just sur surround yourself with God. Sing with God. You know, instead of uh, the music that we've been listening to lately, and I'm not against music, but turn on some worship songs and let that be your source of entertainment for a long time. Get rid of the world's entertainment. Get rid of the world's wine and be filled with the wine of God. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So that's what God wants us to do in our lives. We're to be filled with the Spirit of God and not the Spirit of this world. Um... Let me give you some examples. Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. Stephen was also full of the Holy Spirit. He's a man of faith. And Barnabas also was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit. There's something about these guys that God used, and you can use them in all kinds of situations and circumstances. Hallelujah. Well, you know what? I'm just going to skip the rest of it. And I just want to go on to uh, the prayer here right now. <clears throat> oh, actually, what I would like to do, I want to call up two people. Lisa... <laughs> Okay, come on up here, Elisa Campbell, and also uh, um, the Liebergers. <laughs> come on up here, if you would, please. Yeah, Joyce and Pat, thank you very much. Uh, we was in a, we was in a, a, Elisa's part of the staff and on Tuesdays and Fridays, and we have a staff meeting every Tuesday, and uh, she came in with this testimony, and I said, man, I want the church to hear that because they hear Terry all the time. I want them to hear stories that affect the rest of the world as well. Amen? So go ahead. And, uh. So a little background. 14 years ago, I received and accepted the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but it wasn't like an overnight prayer language. Um, Callan was a newborn, and he, was, he had croup a lot. He has asthma. And I had to spend a lot of time rocking him. He never napped, and I got a lot of practice with my prayer language. And so practicing, praying, praying, practicing, um, and pretty soon I was speaking in tongues, and it got me through a really, really difficult time as a mom, and as Callan got a little bit older and he could speak, and I wasn't using my prayer language as much, he used to say to me, Mom, can you speak in that Chinese language for me? <laughs> so my kids were influenced early on, Hallelujah. but then my my use of it has been mostly for church 
like if I don't know how to pray for somebody or um, by myself. And so just recently, even with the, the sermons that we've been going through, uh, Pastor Terry talked a couple weeks ago about how it was a pure language and how it was it was from God. It was exactly what he wanted me to pray. So a few weeks ago, I had, I'm in a group text with my sisters. They're all in Wisconsin and I'm down here. And I can't do much more than pray. Um, it was a really difficult situation at the time. I couldn't be there. And God had already told me that the situation was going to be okay, but it just kept getting worse through the text and worse. And I was on my way to save a lot. And I can't stop and just pray in the middle of save a lot. So in my head, I'm praying and I'm, I, I'm doing what I can do. And I keep getting these texts and it's getting worse and it's getting worse. And get in the car and I keep looking at my phone. And anyway, I get home and I've got a car load full of groceries that I need to get out. But I'm looking at my phone and, and it's getting worse. And so I sat there and I turned the air conditioning on because it's really, really hot in, the, in my garage. And um, I just sat there. And God said, I already told you there's victory, but you need to pray, and you need to pray in my language. So I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed, and I cried, and then my thoughts would, in English, would go to the situation, and then I would say, Lord, you have victory in English, and then I'd pray in the Spirit, and back and forth, and back and forth, and this must have went on for like 45 minutes, and I didn't look at my phone, because I didn't want to be more discouraged. He had already given me victory. <laughs> And I stopped, and I looked at my phone. I stopped praying at this point, and I scrolled back on the messages. And from the point I stopped praying till the or the started praying to the st place I stopped praying, it had gone from bad to better to better to better to better to victory. Hallelujah. I mean, victory. And there Hallelujah. Was, so that's my testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hallelujah. Come on over here. Ah, oh, praise the Lord. You know what? That is exactly it. See, how do I do that? Pray in, the, in, your, in your understanding and in the Spirit. In your understanding and in the Spirit. Go back and forth. Go back and forth. But pray, 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 and trust. And I love that. I love that. God, she already knew the victory, but the Lord, that's awesome. Praise the Lord. Go ahead. Well, he asked us to come back up again this week. Yes, I did. I, 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 they, he sent me a text, and I said, you know what? I don't care. Bring, I want you back up here. I wanted you to give it another testimony. You may be seated. Oh, thank you. <laughs> no, uh, you know, I, I'm going to give a little bit of background. I told him if he's going to have us up here all the time, then I'm not going to do it real quick next time. He always says, make it quick. Well, that's it. We're done. <laughs> no, for about the last year and a half, my family's been through hell, to put it bluntly. Um, we, I still don't have full-time work. Um, the devil's been fighting very hard, physically, been through surgeries. Um, so this is our breakthrough moment. This, this time has come that we're receiving the healings and uh, been through times where I would be up at three o'clock in the morning praying because we didn't know how we were going to feed the kids the next day didn't have any money in our account negative account balance no food in the house um, but the Lord we made it through the Lord always <coughs> took care of us um, one night three o'clock in the morning I'm praying and God tells me to clean out the cubby in my my cubby in the bathroom and I thought that was strange I was like did my wife call you earlier tonight because that sounds like something she'd say clean out the cubby <laughs> well next morning I'm getting ready for the day and I go and I thought well this isn't gonna do any good but I'll do it anyway <laughs> clean out the cubby and I come across an old paycheck that it somehow got stuck in there that uncashed paycheck <laughs> we were able to go buy groceries so he always took care of us I don't know how I got in there he put it there obviously so this is I just want to give a little bit of a background the, the devil tries to try has tried to split us up God's called us into ministry uh, he has physically uh, shown up in our house, uh, manifested himself one night physically in our home. He's, he's tried to, to separate us. He did not succeed, obviously. But uh, I did contact Terry again this week. We were pretty excited. My wife has had uh, knee surgery, 
So one of her legs for quite some time has been almost an inch shorter than the other. And uh, the other night after what happened last week, we decided to pray for it and we watched it grow about an inch. She felt it and we physically watched it grow about an inch the other day. So we're pretty excited. God is working miracles and we're excited about it. So we just hope that's an encouragement to everyone. Amen. Thank you very much. Hallelujah. I'll tell you what, God is on the move. It's just all in the faith. If someone wants to speak, let me turn this back on. But The second to last song we sang, um, the word I remember is Asian believers. But towards the end of that song, I don't know if it was a verse or a chorus, it says something about the darkness. And then would it be hard to pull that song up? Powers of darkness can't drown out a single word. And it hit me really hard. And it goes along with Elisa's testimony, your sermon, the powers of darkness. How many have felt like the powers of darkness have been just terrible in the last week? I'm talking current events. About everybody here, I'm sure. What the Lord spoke to me during that song Again, it goes with everything that was said today. Don't stop praying. Don't stop praising. The powers of darkness cannot drown out your single word. Amen. Amen. The powers of darkness will not win. And Elisa was giving her testimony. The power of darkness will not win. God has the victory already won. Keep praising. Keep praying. These events will not win. Amen. Thank you very much. God bless you. All right, I want to pray for you, and I want us to pray. And listen, again, if you came up here last week and you felt like, ah, I got passed over, <laughs> that's a lie of hell. Amen? You did not get passed over. God is blessing you. God is pouring out His Spirit upon you. You are filled with the Spirit of God. You, it will come. It will just when you're unexpected I don't know but when you start surrendering you surrender your words you surrender your lips you surrender your life to the Holy Spirit and He will lead you and direct you and guide you and it will come I promise you you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit we laid hands upon you we believed and that's what all you need that's all you need Amen let me pray for you Hallelujah Holy Spirit you have ordained today's today (laughs) this is the day the lord has made and god we are rejoicing and we are glad in what you're doing in our lives and what you're doing in the church and lord god we don't want to just leave this place say well it's happening only in those four walls no god we are the church of jesus christ amen and everywhere that we go lord you want to manifest yourself in our lives lord god through the Spirit, through all the gifts of the Spirit, and through all kinds of things in our lives, Lord God. We don't even know. It is a great adventure to serve a living God. Amen? It is a great adventure. So, Lord, I I just pray right now uh, for a a release of the Spirit of God in our lives. Lord, like I said, it's very evident you ordained through the the two different words, Lord God. And then this word of encouragement here at the end, and then the testimonies, Lord God. Today, is the day that you're saying you're my child and I love you and you are more than an overcomer. You're victorious through me and through my spirit which will give you strength. Hallelujah. My spirit will give you strength and you are going to live a supernatural spiritual life and in this supernatural spirit life uh, the world is going to be changed just as the world changed in the book of Acts. I'm still the same God and I still have the same desires to change your world and to change this city and the lives of those around. You are my church. You are my people. You are the tabernacle of my spirit. And then you are going to go into all the world. And you're going to make a difference everywhere you go. Fear is gone out of your life right now in Jesus' mighty name. Fear of what the world may think. Fear of what the people may think is gone. They have no influence in our lives. They have no hold upon our lives in Jesus' name. We live to honor God. We live to bless God. We live to please you, Lord God. And Lord, you says that you find no pleasure in those who do not have faith in you. So Lord God, we just give you our words and we just give you our lives and we have faith in you right now you you still receive us but you don't find any pleasure in us in that so lord god we give your lives today hallelujah lord god and we just ask for the outpouring of the holy spirit lord that you just open up the heavens right now above every one of our lives in jesus name amen lord if these heavens are brass in our lives lord god that you just 
pull them back as you did that veil in the temple and that you would just pour out your spirit today upon your church in Jesus' mighty name, Lord God. Hallelujah, Lord God. Through signs and wonders, through changed lives, through uh, supernatural love, through witnessing, through the lack of fear in Jesus' name, through the fruits of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. I pray that today for your church and all those who believe and want to receive, say a loud amen. Amen. If you have made a commitment to Jesus Christ after listening to this message, or if you have any questions concerning our ministry here at Faith Outreach Center, we would like to hear from you. Please contact us through our website at www.faithoutreach.cc or you can call us at 574-223-7631. We would be happy to assist you in any way we can. On behalf of Faith Outreach Center, this is Roger Vogel saying, God bless.